October 28th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Ezekiel chapters 8 through 10 of the Old Testament. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth of the month, as I was sitting in my house with the elders of Judah sitting in front of me, the hand of the Sovereign Lord seized me. As I watched, I noticed a form that appeared to be a man. From his waist downward was something like fire, and from his waist upward, something like a brightness, like an amber glow. He stretched out the form of a hand and grabbed me by a lock of hair on my head. Then a wind lifted me up between the earth and sky and brought me to Jerusalem by means of divine visions, to the door of the inner gate which faces north, where the statue which provokes to jealousy was located. Then I perceived that the glory of the God of Israel was there, as in the vision I had seen earlier in the valley. He said to me, Son of man, look up toward the north. So I looked up toward the north, and I noticed to the north of the altar gate was this statue of jealousy at the entrance. He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the people of Israel are practicing here to drive me far from my sanctuary? But you will see greater abominations than these. He brought me to the entrance of the court, and as I watched, I noticed a hole in the wall. He said to me, Son of man, dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and discovered a doorway. He said to me, Go in and see the evil abominations they are practicing here. So I went in and looked. I noticed every figure of creeping thing and beast, detestable images, and every idol of the house of Israel engraved on the wall all around. Seventy men from the elders of the house of Israel, with Jeazaniah, son of Shaphan, standing among them, were standing in front of them. Each with a censer in his hand and fragrant vapors from a cloud of incense were swirling upward. He said to me, Do you see, son of man, what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, each in the chamber of his idolatrous images? For they think the Lord does not see us. The Lord has abandoned the land. He said to me, You will see them practicing even greater abominations. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the Lord's house. I noticed women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? You will see even greater abominations than these. Then he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. Right there at the entrance to the Lord's temple between the porch and the altar were about twenty-five men with their backs to the Lord's temple facing east. They were worshiping the sun toward the east. He said to me, Do you see, son of man? Is it a trivial thing that the house of Judah commits these abominations they are practicing here? For they have filled the land with violence and provoked me to anger still further. Look, they are putting the branch to their nose. Therefore I will act with fury. My eye will not pity them, nor will I spare them. When they have shouted in my ears, I will not listen to them. Then he shouted in my ears, Approach, you who are to visit destruction on the city, each with his destructive weapon in his hand. Next I noticed six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his war club in his hand. Among them was a man dressed in linen with a writing kit at his side. They came and stood beside the bronze altar. Then the glory of the God of Israel went up from the cherub where it had rested to the threshold of the temple. He called to the man dressed in linen who had the writing kit at his side. The Lord said to him, Go through the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the people who moan and groan over all the abominations practiced in it. While I listened, he said to the others, Go through the city after him and strike people down. Do not let your eye pity nor spare anyone, old men, young men, young women, little children, and women. Wipe them out. But do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were at the front of the temple. He said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courtyards with corpses. Go. 
So they went out and struck people down throughout the city. While they were striking them down, I was left alone, and I threw myself face down and cried out, Ah, Sovereign Lord, will you destroy the entire remnant of Israel when you pour out your fury on Jerusalem? He said to me, The sin of the house of Israel and Judah is extremely great. The land is full of murder, and the city is full of corruption. For they say, The Lord has abandoned the land, and the Lord does not see. But as for me, my eyes will not pity them, nor will I spare them. I hereby repay them for what they have done. Next I noticed the man dressed in linen with the writing kit at his side, bringing back word. I have done just as you commanded me. As I watched, I saw on the platform above the top of the cherubim something like a sapphire resembling the shape of a throne appearing above them. The Lord said to the man dressed in linen, Go between the wheelwork underneath the cherubim. Fill your hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them over the city. He went as I watched. The cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and a cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord arose from the cherub and moved to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud while the court was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. The sound of the wings of the cherubim could be heard from the outer court, like the sound of the sovereign God when he speaks. When the Lord commanded the man dressed in linen, Take fire from within the wheelwork from among the cherubim. The man went in and stood by one of the wheels. Then one of the cherubim stretched out his hand toward the fire which was among the cherubim. He took some and put it into the hands of the man dressed in linen who took it and left. The cherubim appeared to have the form of human hands under their wings. As I watched, I noticed four wheels by the cherubim. One wheel beside each cherub, the wheels gleam like jasper. As for their appearance, all four of them look the same, something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they would go in any of the four directions they faced without turning as they moved. In the direction the head would turn, they would follow without turning as they moved. Along with their entire bodies, their backs, their hands, and their wings, the wheels of the four of them were full of eyes all around. As for their wheels, they were called the wheel work as I listened. Each of the cherubim had four faces. The first was the face of a cherub, the second that of a man, the third that of a lion, and the fourth that of an eagle. The cherubim rose up. These were the living beings I saw at the Kibar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels moved beside them. When the cherubim spread their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels did not move from their side. When the cherubim stood still, the wheels stood still, and when they rose up, the wheels rose up with them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Then the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings and they rose up from the earth while I watched. When they went, the wheels went alongside them. They stopped at the entrance to the east gate of the Lord's temple, as the glory of the God of Israel hovered above them. These were the living creatures which I saw at the Kibar River underneath the God of Israel. I knew that they were cherubim. Each had four faces, each had four wings, and the form of human hands under the wings. As for the form of their faces, they were the faces whose appearance I had seen at the Kibar River. Each one moves straight ahead. God, as I was reading the, the visions that you were showing Ezekiel of people and their idols and the abominations, and each one kept getting worse and worse and worse, and they sound a little bit foreign to us. We don't really understand, except historically, the gates and, and how important those were at the time. Uh, to people, um, the understanding of the women crying, it was actually crying for a uh, cult god who um, set up, uh, how do I say this, marriage 
to prostitutes to ensure uh, vegetation grew basically and they were crying uh, for him uh, and then the last one with people standing where priests your priest should have stood and instead of worshiping you even as common people they were worshiping the sun and as I was thinking about Ezekiel's visions that you showed him I realized that you give those to us every single day and they're not visions they're things that are right in front of our face constantly throughout the day if we turn on TV almost any channel is going to show us idol worship uh, the worst worship of sex the worship of beauty the worship of brands and titles the worship of being in a relationship the the idol of money very much we see on TV um, if we go on the internet whether it be Facebook or websites or whatever we see definitely the worship and idols of the music industry of Hollywood of the sports industry all having to do with money and fame and ego we can turn on the the news or read it in the newspaper <laughs> instead Sadly, most of the time, instead of it being filled with anything constructive, it's filled with uh, the idol worship of egos between warring countries, which are people, and then quickly deteriorates into the latest gossip of the day with various families and who slept with who and who took clothes off and who sang what song to whom. And God, we're seeing these same exact visions, these same abominations but they're part of our culture. We're actually being fed them by the marketing and advertising industry. And we can't blame them solely, not at all, because if we watch those TV shows, if we read those newspapers, if we go to those websites online, if we go and watch those movies, if we read those books, we are participating just as much, if not more, by purchasing and consuming these types of products and agreeing to become part of that idle process. I wonder if we understand just how much of that throughout the day we're actually seeing. Now, here's the difference. Ezekiel was called to do something about it. He was very clearly called to do something about it. I believe that we are called too, maybe not as black and white as Ezekiel is, except throughout the Bible, we are called to go and do and tell people about you. But we are so numb to the images that we see every day that unless we intentionally pay attention to what is being fed into our lives and our, our brain cells and our heart all throughout the day, I don't think we realize just how horrid our lives are in the sense of worshiping idols. I guarantee you, if I went into church tomorrow and said, so I'd like any of you who are, who are worshiping idols to raise your hand. And I'm pretty much guessing that n nobody would raise their hand. But we worship TV. Uh, we worship comfort. We worship our days off. Uh, we worship our desires of doing things that we want to do over what you want us to do. Oh my goodness. God, there's so many things that we worship and so many things that are idols in our life. And like I said, they're not visions. They are part of our actual world, our day in, day out world. And so unless we partition ourselves off and away from these things, if we intentionally stay away from these idols, it is about the only way that they can't infiltrate our lives. And as much as I partition my life off from the world, if you ask me, I can still tell you what's going on in the world. I see enough of it participating online and in different social functions, um, friends talking about it, um, different magazines I might pick up. I still see it way more than I should. So I can't imagine the people who are inundated in today's society, in in the world itself how much of that idol worship is happening in their own lives god this this particular passage and passages in ezekiel just really bother me as i realize that day in and day out that we are receiving those exact same messages but they are clear messages that we have to have these things in order to be liked in order to be loved in order to get promoted in order to all of these things 
It's not just visions of you showing a prophet something that's bad. We are actually being told that this is what we need in order to be successful in this world. God, please, please remove those idols from our lives. And if we think we don't have any idols, please, please, God, show us the idols that we do have that that we so clearly worship things that aren't of your will. And in doing so, allow us to start to pull away from the world. You called us not to be of this world, God, not in the slightest. Allow our priorities and our time spent to be spent on things that won't burn up in that fire at the very end, that they will be things of gold that will matter to your kingdom. God, this world is very scary in what it holds and what it worships in its mass exodus away from participating in a relationship with you. Even though you clearly called Ezekiel black and white and told him exactly what he had to do and not do, I truly believe you've done the same thing for us. That not only do we need to not participate in that kind of lifestyle, but we need to be vocal about that kind of lifestyle. And not just accept it because it's part of the culture. If we continue to accept it inch by inch by inch, it's going to continue to get worse. God, allow us today to make a stand first and foremost in our own lives of what we'll allow to come into our lives, into our homes, into our hearts, into our minds. That we intentionally watch what we watch, what we read, what we see, what we hear, what we talk about. And then part two, that that other people would very clearly know how we felt about those things. It doesn't have to be in a mean way. It can be definitely still out of love. But that we're very clear about our boundaries and why we believe those things are bad. Those idols that are in our lives that we worship. God, hold, hold us to the fire on this. This is so incredibly important when we realize just how much of our lives are filled with idols that we willingly worship. We even pay to worship these idols. God, strengthen us so that we do your will and that you are our only God in our life, in our heart, in our mind, in our actions, in our words. In your son's name I pray. Amen.